What is up, Vox Youth? It's Mike here. If we have yet to meet, hopefully we'll meet sometime soon. But I'm our Central Youth Coordinator here at Vox Church, here because I'm here at one of our locations at Vox Church. And I am so glad that you decided to join us for the first Vox Youth Youth House of 2021. Isn't that crazy? We made it to 2021. Oh my goodness. And what a wild year it's been so far. So let's take a deep breath. Ready, ready. Breathe in. <gasps> Breathe out one more time. You ready? <gasps> oh, okay. Let's just let everything that's been happening. I'm talking in the nice calm voice, right? Soothing voice, just like honey. Right? Let all the things that are happening, all the distractions, just fall away for a moment as we spend some time with one another looking to God's word to try to see who God is a little bit more clearly so we can see not just who we are, but how we're meant to live our lives, okay? So all the things that are happening around us, let's just take a moment to block those things out. Those feelings you're feeling, the thoughts you're having, they're not, not, they're not unreal, right? They're real, you feel them, they're there. But let's take a moment to decide. We're gonna tune in, we're gonna hone in. You've heard me say this before, if, if you've been to really any of these or you were at the Christmas party, it's time to get out of that spiritual doggy bag, right? Take some notes so you can take it home and eat some leftovers later, the things you can't digest just right now, because we're gonna dive into some simple truths, yet extremely profound truths that I believe if we decide to take a hold of tonight, and this is for me included, if we decide to take a hold of these things, we're not going to leave wherever you are the same as you walked in. You're going to actually leave experiencing life to the fullest, at least in a higher degree than when you walked in. And again, this isn't just for me. This isn't just for you. This is for your leaders. This is for all of us, right? Truth is truth, and we need to hold on to it because it applies to each and every one of us. So leaders, get your spiritual dog and bag ready too because I believe this is a word for all of us, all right? We're going to be in Hebrews 1. If you want to get your Bible, your glow Bible, your, your paper Bible, whatever Bible you have in your hand, Hebrews 1. But before we go there together, as you're flipping through some pages, I want to tell you a story of a very famous detective. He's a French detective. And, you know, there's, there's some uh, movies about his life, or at least about some of the cases that he solved, some big cases he solved. His name is Detective Clouseau. And you may know already that he's the detective from Pink Panther. Oh my goodness, if you have yet to see Pink Panther, one, I feel kind of old. And two, <laughs> you need to go watch the Pink Panther. There's some good stuff. All right, some good stuff. But Detective Clouseau, he's French. He has a French accent. He speaks French. He's trying to learn English, at least a little bit more at pronunciation and things than he has been doing. He wants to get a little bit better. He wants to grow in that area of his life just a little bit. I just want to take a moment and pause. He's going to be shaking a little bit. It's because I'm not drinking water. I'm drinking bang, and it's so good. Got to hydrate, right? Mm. Cotton candy flavored. Oh, so good. Brings me to the circus. Detective Clouseau, we're going back. You see, like, I'm like, eh, eh, I'm everywhere. Okay, all right, let's focus. Let's focus. <laughs> Trying to learn how to say a simple phrase with less of a French accent. I would like to buy a hamburger. Seems simple enough, right? And you see his translation coach or his English coach. She's super proper. She's from Great Britain, most likely. I would like to buy a hamburger. Say it with me. And he goes, I would like to buy the hamburger. He's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're saying hamburger. He's like, no, I'm not saying, I'm saying I would like to buy a hamburger. I'm like, what do you think I'm saying? And little did he know that this simple thing he's trying to learn, this simple, small, seemingly insignificant thing, is going to get him in some big trouble because he is at risk. He's at risk. And just a few scenes later, he's at the airport and he's talking to his partner. He's saying, oh, give me the hamburger. Give me the, you can't say it, but give me the, the thing. Uh, you know, airline food is for suckers is what he says. And how true is that, right? You get the little bag of peanuts. Maybe you get the little unsalted, super dry crackers with a tiny cup of ice that they call water. It's not very good. If you've been on an airline recently, they don't even give you snacks because COVID, which is safe, but not delicious. Okay. I always err on the side of deliciousness. Safety should be more of a priority, but that's okay. That's okay. Airline food is for suckers. So he has air, the, the hamburgers in his pocket. He's walking through security and they're checking his bag. Like, all right, we need to do a hand check. We need to check the bag by hand because the sensor picks something up. He's like, oh, that's okay. I'm, nothing's in the bag. And he looks back and he winks because he has the hamburgers in his pockets. And they check that they dump everything out of the bag. And little did he know, someone switched the bag. So there's a bunch of weapons. And he's like, no, no, I've never seen those nunchucks in my life. Like, what's going on here? And then the, he has his hands in his pockets because the hamburgers are in his pockets. And they're asking him, sir, what's in your pockets? Because they have the dog, I'm Jimbo, sick him, right? Yeah, the German Shepherd. I, I got nothing in my pockets. You know, what's in your pockets? Eventually, he tries to say hamburger, but he can't say it. He can't. He just can't say it. He was at risk. 
and he had no idea that simply not being able to say hamburger would get him bitten by this German shepherd named Jimbo. Let me tell you something, student. You may be surprised to hear this, but you are at risk. Right now, look up, there's a ceiling. <laughs> there might be a ceiling fan above you. I, I don't think you're at risk of it falling. But you are at risk. We're all at risk of something pretty significant, but easily forgotten. You are at risk. I am at risk. We are at risk of being distracted. Something so small. Pronouncing hamburger. Being distracted. Something that happens so often. Yet it poses a very real risk to the life that we live. There are a few things that distract us, are there not? Culture, for one, right? Culture distracts us. Entertainment in itself is a distraction. Entertainment brings no real value to our life other than maybe building a knowledge of some foreign world or maybe building some real knowledge as you watch a documentary or whatever it would be. There's enhancements that entertainment may bring, but at its base level, it's a distraction. It's to escape in some way or another. I'm not saying entertainment's bad in itself. I enjoy it. I love movies. I enjoy entertainment. But entertainment in itself, this cultural thing, right, is a distraction. And then you go on to this thing called social equity. Have you heard that before? It's the things that society would say, that culture would say, either build up your popularity, your equity, or would decrease it. You're taking away from your equity. You're lowering your status. And the things that build you up, right? How many likes you would get on Instagram? How many followers on TikTok? Whatever. You're going viral. You're going, out. why haven't I gone viral yet? Where am I? You know, these things that build you up and then the things that take away. You're not going to have that hard conversation with your friend because you know they're doing something a little bit destructive. But if you call them out on it, then their truth isn't their truth anymore. And you know, that's what we value as a culture right now. So you, you avoid doing those things to keep your social status a little bit higher, right? Whatever it may be, you either do more things to try to grab some equity or you avoid things that you know you should do to keep your status built up. So that's culture, right? And then you have tradition. I'm an Italian person. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. My family is from Italy, right? We're from Sicily, Malili, Sicily. So there are things that we have as a family that are tradition that you don't really mess with. Like how you say certain words. Maybe for you, this certain cheese that's super delicious is ricotta. Well, for us, it's regatta, all right? You say ricotta and great grandma's giving you the side eye. Like, what did you what'd you say? Like little things, traditional things. My family does it this way, so that's how it should happen, at least for me. And then there are the opposite side of tradition of my family does it that way, so I'm going to do it any other way, right? You realize this is not something I want to continue. Traditions distract us and pull for our attention. Traditions change the way that we, you know, interact with life. And then we have our own thoughts. Oh, one that comes to mind for me, a distracting thought is anger. Have you ever had an argument with someone in your head? And they don't even know what's going on because it's all in your head just because you're so angry. And I'm going to say this and then she's going to respond with this. And I'm like, oh, no, she didn't. And then you're going to respond. And you have this whole argument play out in your head because you're angry. And it's distracting you from whatever's in front of you right now. You can't focus on anything else because you're so angry that your attention is on this imaginary thing that's going on. And then you pass each other in the hallway. It's like, oh, hey, hey. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? Maybe for you, it's jealousy. The jealous thoughts in your mind never let you be satisfied with what's in your hand. Oh, I wish I had another flavor of bang because cotton candy, uh, cotton candy is a really good flavor. But you can't enjoy it, right? I can't enjoy the cotton candy because I wish I had some other flavor. Jealousy distracts us from what we're holding right now because we're always looking for the next thing, the better thing, whatever is going on next. Maybe it's not a bad thing. Maybe it's your responsibilities, the things you should pay attention to, but you feel so much pressure that even when you're not in the midst of being able to affect your responsibility, maybe you're hanging out with your friends, enjoying time with your buddies, and you have this test that's coming up, and you've studied, and you've done your due diligence, and you're doing things the right way, yet you're so stressed out that in the moment, you get so, ah, you get so caught up in your responsibilities that you're so distracted from what's happened, the things that should be a blessing to you, become pushed aside because you're so fixed. We get distracted so easily in our day and age with a constant stream of information more than ever. I would say more than any other time in history, you're being pulled and stretched and urged and pushed. And oh man, if you, we can just look inside of our head, if we can see the brain waves that are going, doo -doo 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 -doo, the nerves, doo -doo -doo, it's lighting up. Why? Because we're being pulled in every direction, and you are at risk, I am at risk, we are at risk of being distracted. And while this time in history is unique, as we have access to so much information, it's not unique to the human problem. What we find, oh man, oh bang! 
<laughs> what we find in Hebrews 1 is the author of this letter, the author of this book, the author of this portion of scripture that we have now, writing to a church that got distracted. A church that had known Jesus, yet as we'll find in a moment, allowed him to be pushed to their side of the view. We're just going to read four verses together. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. If you would like, you can read along with me as we dive into the word together. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he was inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's just pray together for a moment, and then we're going to unpack this and what it means for us today. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to meet with you tonight. This isn't just a time for us to hang out and eat whatever food we're having in this moment, to, to hang out with our friends, maybe that we've made or we've had for a while, to see that leader that we've been waiting to connect with again. Maybe we've been dropped off here by our parents and we didn't have a choice, but we know, God, that tonight is not just a normal night because we have an opportunity to meet with you, to encounter who you are in this very moment. Would you allow us to have this encounter with you today? that any distraction that we're always at risk of, that we're allowing to grip our attention and pull us away, that you would cast it out, that you would let us be centered and focused on you. Bring our focus back to you, Jesus, that we would leave here different than we came in. Would you illuminate the truth of your word to us in this very moment? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So like I was saying, the, the author of Hebrews is writing to this church. They encounter Jesus at some point, right? They are, they, these are Christians he's writing to. And he starts this book of Hebrews, which we're going to, as a youth group, right, take a, a while, however long it takes us, to get through the entirety of the book of Hebrews, right? Isn't that exciting to go cover to cover, front page to last page of this book of Hebrews, so we can unpack all of the truths that build upon each other as you go from chapter 1 to chapter 13? I'm so pumped for this. I hope that you are too, especially as we look at these first four verses verses as they lay the foundation of what we're going to be reading. The author of Hebrews is starting with, you are distracted. You have made Jesus small in your life, in your mind, in your heart, and now it is time to refocus. It is time to stop going like this with Jesus over here and not just go like this, but to refocus. It is time to refocus because the effect of being distracted is that we lose sight of who Jesus is. And what happens when we lose sight of who Jesus is, this is what happens. Jesus is no longer the Savior. He's just another voice. His, his words become recommendations or suggestions. He's no longer the centrality, the beginning and the end, the middle point of the story, the focus of all of creation. Everything's held together by the word of, the, the word of power, right? His word of power. Everything's held, the fabric of the universe is held together by his power. Yet we allow him to become peripheral. That test coming up takes your attention and Jesus becomes small. That relationship that's on the rocks, the friend you've had for a long time, that maybe they stabbed you, maybe you betrayed your friend. And the guilt, the condemnation, you, feel, you allow Jesus to become small. It's what happens when we get distracted. Yet right now I'm saying you are at risk of a detrimental, uh, uh, you know, this is so bad for us. When we go here, why? Let me tell you, in my own life, today, I'm telling you, today, the day we're recording this, I woke up and I'm stressed. I don't know, maybe you didn't know this, I'm an emotional guy. On the brink of tears, most of my morning. And it took someone asking me, someone much wiser than I am, hey, Mike, like, after I was meeting them with them for a little while, why are you on the, the, the edge of almost shedding tears for the last 30 minutes? And I realized, you know, it's what I, I'm about to talk to students about, this propensity for us to lose focus on Jesus, to allow him to become small in our mind, in our heart, is exactly what I'm in right now. For me, it was the pressures of work in a relationship that allowed Jesus to lose the center, the center point of my life. And what happens? What happens? We begin to fall apart. We begin to fall apart. 
Jesus is the center of the story. He's not just another voice. He is the word in which all things were created by and for and, 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 and through. By him, through him, and for him. He is not just another voice. He is the word. When Jesus speaks, it's not just a suggestion or, or a direction to urge you towards. It is the avenue that we receive life. He actually knows what you need. Did you know that? He's not just speaking to you to try to take things away or try to push you in a direction and say, hey, this is maybe how you should do things. He's saying, no, 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 no. I know you so well because I created you that I'm going to prescribe life to you. That when I speak, I'm not just giving you some direction. I'm prescribing life. And he's not just a character in the story. He's the center point of it all. All things held together by his word of power. He's not just an option. Maybe he is. But let me tell you, there's not 70, there's two. It's Jesus or death. How often do we look at it with that perspective? That we have two choices in life. We have two choices right now. Jesus at the center. Or death. And maybe you're a believer, you're walking with God, you believe in Jesus, and, and you would say, I have accepted salvation, and I'm walking, and, and I'm going to be in heaven someday. And that's great. But right now, even in the small circumstance, even in my morning today, I have a choice. Jesus at the center the effects of sin and death today, right? My world is crumbling because I am my own savior in this moment and I cannot hold that weight. Yet Jesus says, put me at the center and I will hold you and walk with you. In your weakness, I am strong. I have a promise of hope and of peace and a secure future. I am the foundation in which you can build your life. Student, he is the foundation for you to build your life upon. And all those other things are still real. That test is still real. That relationship is real. The anger you feel is not not real, but there's a solution and a salvation for you. There's a hope for you to cling to. There's more than those things. Yet when Jesus is not the center, those things become the focus and then they infiltrate the deep fabric of your life and the cracks, oh man, they start to build up until like this morning for me. I'm not speaking to you out of, uh, you know, a third part. This is me, guys. This is us as people. We need to keep our eyes on this. We need to constantly go back. It's not a one-time choice. Constantly go back to Jesus at the center. <laughs> And it's not just because Mike told you so. Let, let's just take a moment. In, in Acts chapter 6, this is the early church, or I'm sorry, chapter 7, we see Stephen, a disciple of Jesus, uh, you know, someone that was walking with Jesus for most of his ministry, if not all of it. This, this guy named Stephen, a faithful follower of Jesus, a Christian, you know, the first martyr of the church. He, he's sharing the gospel. He's talking about who Jesus is to people who do not want to hear it, who are not happy with the truth that he was sharing. And then eventually Stephen has this vision. He looks up and he sees Jesus at the right hand of the Father in heaven. This is after Jesus had died. So to say that Jesus is at the right hand, what, this is not what the people he was talking to wanted to hear. So what do they do? They get angry and they harden their hearts and they rushed him and they took him out of the city and they stoned him. They killed him. Yet in those moments, what, as he was being stoned, the stones are real. They're hitting him and they, he's dying by these stones. And at the moment, in the moments of these stones being thrown at him, in the moment of his death, he's saying, Lord, forgive them for what they do. They know not what they do. How is this possible? Well, I hope that being stoned isn't what's distracting you or potentially distracting you in this moment. But there are distractions. Always at risk of being distracted. And whatever it is for you, Whatever it is for you, there's a hope you can cling to, but you need to remember where Jesus sits. You need to remember who he is. Because in the moment, in the moment of the anger, in the moment of the heart, in the moment of the anxiety and the depression, what happens is that begins to take center point in our story, in our day, in our life. And you're faced with the choice. Will I refocus? Not to ignore these things. Will I refocus on Jesus? And will I allow the truth of who he is? That he is God who stepped into my situation. God from the beginning. 
before the beginning of time, stepped into flesh and bones and became a man so that he can know me. That he can offer me salvation. Will I refocus my attention on that truth? So I actually find the solution that I need in the midst of my problem and distraction. Maybe you're a believer. You, you've, you, when I say that, you're walking with God, right? You're a Christian. You have accepted Jesus. You've responded to the gospel. Right now, you have a choice. We all do. What will you focus on? What will you focus on? The distractions are going to be there. They're not going to go away. And that's okay. It doesn't mean you're condemned to a life of, of a lack of focus on Jesus. But you have a choice right now. What will you focus on in this very moment and as you leave here today? What's pulling for your attention? What's central to the story of your life? I would urge you to choose Jesus in this moment. And maybe for you, you've never heard the gospel of the good news of Jesus. You've never heard that God himself, the God of the universe, desires to be in relationship with you so much. We were created for a relationship with him, not for some need that God had, just simply because he desires to know us and for us to know him. That this God of the universe would, would actually step into our situation to do the thing that we couldn't do, to bridge the gap created by our own brokenness, that we can now know him again. That Jesus is not an option for salvation or a good teacher. He is the only way that we can actually be alive. It's Jesus or death. And that may sound scary for a moment. But here's the redeeming truth. Here's the good news. That Jesus has been calling you the whole time. You have a choice in this moment as well. Will you continue to walk? in the mundane things, the temporary things that maybe satisfy or really just distract for today, where you step into the life that Jesus is offering you, a lasting, a good, fulfilling, eternal life that you can find nowhere else, no matter how hard you try to look. You need a Savior, and his name is Jesus. And he's calling you in this very moment. And have everyone bow their heads and close their eyes.